Chapter Five of the People of the Mist by H. Ryder Haggard. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Otter gives counsel. When the burial was finished and Thomas Ottram slept his last sleep beneath six feet of earth and stones, his brother took out the prayer book that Jane Beach had given him, which in truth formed all his library and read the funeral service over the grave, ending it by the glare of the lightning flashes. Then he and Otter went back to the cave and ate, speaking no word. After they had done their meal, Leonard called to the dwarf, who took his food at a little distance. Otter, he said, setting the lantern between them, you are a faithful man and clever in your way. I would tell you a story and ask you something. At the least, he added to himself in English, in such a matter, your judgment is as good as mine. Speak on, boss, said the dwarf. My ears are open. And he squatted down on the further side of the lantern, like some great toad, watching his master's face with his black eyes. Otter, the boss who is dead and I journeyed to this country about seven years ago. Before we came here, we had been rich men, chiefs in our own place. But we lost our corrals and cattle and lands. They were sold, others took them, and we became poor. Yes, we, who were fat, grew lean, as trek oxen at the end of winter. Then we said to each other, Here we have no longer any home. The shame of poverty has come upon us. We are broken vessels, empty men of no account. Also we are chiefs by blood, and here we cannot let ourselves out to labor like the common people, lest both the common people and the nobles should make a mock of us. Our great stone corral, that has been ours for many generations, is taken from us. Others dwell in it. Strange women order it, and their children shall move about the land. We will go away. The blood is the blood, broke in Otter. The wealth is nothing. That comes and goes. But the blood is always the blood. Why did you not gather an impi, my father, and put these strangers to the spear, and take your corral again? In our land this may not be, Otter, for there wealth is more than race. So we should have been brought to still greater shame. Riches alone could give us back our home, and we had none left. Therefore we swore an oath together, the dead boss and I, that we would journey to this far country and seek to win wealth, that we might buy back our lands and corral and rule over them as in past years, and our children after us. A good oath, said Otter, but here we should have sworn it otherwise, and there would have been a ringing of steel about the corral, not the chink of yellow iron. We came, Otter, and for seven years we have labored harder than the lowest of our servants. We have traveled to and fro, mixing with many peoples, learning many tongues, and what have we found? The boss yonder, a grave in the wilderness, I, the food that the wilderness gives, no more. A poor wage so far, said Otter. Ah, the ways of my people are more simple and better. A red spear is brighter than the red gold, yes, and it is more honest. The wealth is unwon, Otter, and I have sworn to win the wealth or die. But last night I swore it again to him who lies dead. It is well, boss, an oath is an oath, and true men must keep it. But riches cannot be gathered here for the gold, most of it, is hid in those rocks that are far too heavy to carry. And who may charm gold out of the rock? Not all the wizards in Zululand. At the least, you and I cannot do it alone, even should the fever spare us. We must trek, boss, and look elsewhere. Listen, Otter, the tale is yet to tell. The boss who is dead dreamed before he died. He dreamed that I should win the gold, that I should win it by the help of a woman, and he bade me wait here a while 
after he was dead. Say now, Otter, you who come of a people learned in dreams, and are the child of a dream doctor, was this a true dream, or a sick man's fancy? Nay, boss, who can tell for sure, the dwarf answered, then pondered a while, and set himself to trace lines in the dust of the floor with his finger. Yet I say, he went on, that the words of the dead uttered on the edge of death shall come true. He promised that you should win the wealth. You will win it by this way or that, and the great corral across the water shall be yours again, and the children of strangers shall wander there no more. Let us obey the words of the dead and bide here a while as he commanded. Seven days had passed, and on the night of the seventh, Leonard Ultram and Otter sat together once more in the little cave on Grave Mountain, for so they named this fatal spot. They did not speak, though each of them was speaking after his own fashion, and both had cause for thought. They had been hunting all day, but killed nothing except a guinea fowl, most of which they had just eaten. It was the only food left to them. Game seemed to have abandoned the district. At least they could find none. Since his brother's death, Leonard had given up all attempt to dig for gold. It was useless. Time hung heavy on his hands. For a man cannot search all day for buck, which are not. Gloom had settled on his mind also. He felt his brother's loss more acutely now than on the day he buried him. Moreover, for the first time, he suffered from symptoms of the deadly fever which had carried off his three companions. Alas, he knew too well the meaning of this lassitude and nausea, and of the racking pain which from time to time shot through his head and limbs. That was how his brother's last sickness had begun. Would his own days end in the same fashion? He did not greatly care. He was reckless as to his fate, for the hard necessities of life had left him little time or inclination to rack himself with spiritual doubts. And yet it was awful to think of. He rehearsed the whole scene in his mind again and yet again, until it became a reality to him. He saw his own last struggle for life, and Otter watching it. He saw the dwarf bearing him in his great arms to a lonely grave, there to cover him with earth, and then, with a sigh, to flee the haunted spot forever. Why did he stop to die of fever? Because his brother had bidden him to do so, with his dying breath, because of a superstition, a folly, which would move any civilized man to scorn. Ah, there was the rub. He was no longer a civilized man. He had lived so long with nature and savages that he had come to be as nature makes the savage. His educated reason told him that this was folly, but his instinct, that faculty which had begun to take the place of educated reason with him, spoke in another voice. He had gone back in the scale of life. He had grown primitive. His mind was as the mind of a Norseman or of an Aztec. It did not seem wonderful to him that his brother should have prophesied upon his dying bed. It did not strike him as strange, even, that he should believe in the prophecy and act upon it. And yet he knew that in all probability this obedience would result in his own death. Those who have lived much with nature will in some degree be familiar with such sensations, for man and nature are ever at variance, and each would shape the other to its ends. In the issue, nature wins. Man boasts continually of his conquest over her, her instincts, her terrors, and her hopes. But let him escape out of his cities, and the fellowship of his kind, let him be alone with her for a while, and where is his supremacy? He sinks back onto her breast again, and is lost there, as in time, to be all his labors shall be lost. The grass of the field and the sand of the desert are more powerful than Babylon. They were there before her, they are after her, and so it is 
with everything physical and moral in their degrees. For here rules a nurse whom we human children must obey at last, however much we may defy her. Thus brooded Leonard as he sat, his hands in his pockets and an empty pipe between his teeth. Their tobacco was done, and yet he drew at the pipe, perhaps from habit, and all the while Otter watched him. Boss, he said at length, you are sick, boss. No, he answered, that is, perhaps a little. Yes, boss, a little. You have said nothing, but I know, I who watch. The fever has touched you with his finger. By and by he will grip you with his whole hand. And then, boss, and then, Otter, good night. Yes, boss, for you, good night. And for me, what? Boss, you think too much and you have nothing to do. That is why you grow sick. Better that we should go and dig again. What for, Otter? Ant bear holes make good graves. Evil talk, boss. Rather, let us go away and wait no more than that you should talk such talk, which is the beginning of death. Then there was silence for a while. The truth is, Otter, said Leonard presently, we are both fools. It is useless for us to stay here with nothing to eat, nothing to drink, nothing to smoke, and only the fever to look forward to, expecting we know not what. But what does it matter? Fools and wise men all come to one end. Lord, how my head aches, and how hot it is. I wish that we had some quinine left. I am going out. And he rose impatiently and left the cave. Otter followed him. He knew where he would go, to his brother's grave. Presently they were there, standing on the hither edge of a ravine. A cloud had hidden the face of the moon, and they could see nothing, so they stood a while idly, waiting for it to pass. As they rested thus, suddenly a moaning sound came to their ears, or rather a sound which, beginning with a moan, ended in a long wail. What is that? asked Leonard, looking toward the shadows on the further side of the ravine, whence the cry seemed to proceed. I do not know, answered Otter, unless it be a ghost or the voice of one who mourns her dead. We are the only mourners here, said Leonard, and as he spoke, once more the low and piercing wail thrilled upon the air. Just then, the cloud passed. The moonlight shone out brilliantly, and they saw who it was that cried aloud in this desolate place. For there, not twenty paces from them, on the other side of the ravine, crouched upon a stone and rocking herself to and fro, as though in agony of despair and grief, sat a tall and withered woman. With an exclamation of surprise, Leonard started towards her, followed by the dwarf. So absorbed was the woman in her sorrow that she neither saw nor heard them. Even when they stood close to her, she did not perceive them, for her face was hidden in her bony hands. Leonard looked at her curiously. She was past middle age, but he could see that once she had been handsome and, for a native, very light in color. Her hair was grizzled and crisp rather than woolly and her hands and feet were slender and finely shaped. At the moment he could discern no more of the woman's personal appearance, for the face was covered, as has been said, and her body wrapped in a tattered blanket. Mother, he said, speaking in the Sisutu dialect, what ails you that you weep here alone? The stranger let drop her hands and sprang up with a cry of fear. As it chanced, her gaze fell first upon the dwarf otter, who was standing in front of her, and at the sight of him the cry died upon her lips, and her sunken cheeks, clear-cut features, and sullen black eyes became as those of one who is petrified with terror. So strange was her aspect, indeed, that the dwarf and his master neither spoke nor moved. They stood hushed and expectant. It was the woman who broke the silence, speaking in a low voice of awe 
and adoration, and, as she spoke, sinking to her knees. "'And hast thou come to claim me at the last?' she said, addressing Otter. "'O thou whose name is Darkness, to whom I was given in marriage, and from whom I fled when I was young. Do I see thee in the flesh, Lord of the Night, King of Blood and Terror? And is this thy priest, or do I but dream? Nay, I dream not. Slay on, thou priest, and let my sin be purged. Here it seems, said Otter, that we have to do with one who is mad. Nay, Yal, the woman answered, I am not mad, though madness has been nigh to me of late. Neither am I named Yal or Darkness, answered the dwarf with irritation. Cease to speak folly, and tell the white lord whence you come, for I weary of this talk. If you are not Yal, black one, the thing is strange, for as Yal is, so you are. But perchance it does not please you, having put on the flesh, to avow yourself before me, at the least be it as you will. If you are not Yal, then I am safe from your vengeance, and if you are Yal, I pray you forget the sins of my youth and spare me. Who is Yal? asked Leonard curiously. Nay, I know not, answered the woman, with a sudden change of manner. Hunger and weariness have turned my brain, and I spoke wandering words. Forget them and give me food, white man, she added in a piteous tone. Give me food, for I starve. There is scant fare here, answered Leonard, but you are welcome to it. Follow me, mother. And he led her across the donga to the cave, the woman limping after him painfully. There Otter gave her meat, and she ate as one eats who has gone hungry for long, greedily, and yet with effort. When she had finished, she looked at Leonard with her keen, dark eyes and said, Say, white lord, are you also a slave trader? No, he answered grimly, I am a slave. Who is your master, then, this black one here? Nay, he is but the slave of a slave. I have no master, mother. I have a mistress, and she is named Fortune. The worst of mistresses, said the old woman, or the best, for she laughs ever behind her frown, and mingles stripes with kisses. The stripes I know well, but not the kisses, answered Leonard gloomily, and then added in another tone, What is your errand, mother? How are you named, and what do you seek wandering alone in the mountains? I am named Soa. I seek succor for one whom I love, and who is in sore distress. Will my lord listen to my tale? Speak on, said Leonard. Then the woman crouched down before him and told this story. End of chapter 5「Of the People of the Mist » by H. Ryder Haggard. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Tale of Soa my lord, I, Soa, am the servant of a white man, a trader, who lives on the banks of the Zambezi, some four days' march from hence, having a house there which he built many years ago. How is the white man named? asked Leonard. The black people call him Mavoon, but his white name is Rude. He's a good master and no common man, but he has this fault that at times he is drunken. Twenty years ago or more, Mavoon, my lord, married a white woman, a Portuguese, whose father dwelt at Delagoa Bay, and who was beautiful, ah, beautiful. Then he settled on the banks of the Zambezi and became a trader, building the house where he is now, or rather, where its ruins are. Here his wife died in childbirth, yes, she died in my arms, and it was I who reared her daughter, Juana, tending her from cradle to this day. Now after the death of his wife, Mavoon, became more drunken. Still, when he is not in liquor, he is very clever and a good trader, 
and several times he has collected ivory and feathers and gold worth much money, and also has bred cattle by hundreds. Then he would say that he must leave the wilderness and go to another country across the water. I know not where, that country whence the Englishmen come. Twice he has started to go, and I with him, and his daughter, Juana. My mistress, who is named the Shepherdess of Heaven by the black people, because they think that she has the gift of foretelling rain. But once Mavoon stopped in a town at Durban in Natal, and getting drunk, he gambled away all his money in a month, and once he lost it in a river, the boat being overset by a river horse, and the ivory and gold sinking out of sight. Still the last time that he started, he left his daughter, the shepherdess, at Durban, and there she stayed for three years, learning those things that white women know, for she is very clever, as clever as she is beautiful and good. Now, for nearly two years, she has been back at the settlement, for she came to Delagoa Bay in a ship, and I with her, and Mavoon met us. But one month gone my mistress, the shepherdess, spoke to her father, Mavoon, telling him that she wearied of her lonely life in the wilderness and wished to sail across the water to the land which is called home. He listened to her, for Mavoon loves his daughter, and said that it should be so. But he said this also, that first he would go on a trading journey up the river to buy a store of ivory of which he knew. Now she was against this, saying, let us start at once. We have tempted chance too long, and once again we are rich. Let us go to Natal and pass over the seas. Still he would not listen, for he is a headstrong man. So on the morrow he started to search for the store of ivory, and the lady Juana, his daughter, wept. For though she is fearless, it was not fitting that she should be left thus alone. Also she hated to be apart from her father for it is when she is not there to watch that he becomes drunken. Mavoon left, and twelve days went by, while I and my mistress, the shepherdess, sat at the settlement waiting till he returned. Now it is the custom of my mistress, when she is dressed, to read each morning from a certain holy book in which are written the laws of the great great whom she worships. On the thirteenth morning, therefore, she sat beneath the veranda of the house, reading in the book according to her custom. And I went about my work, making food ready. Suddenly I heard a tumult, and looking over the wall which is round the garden and to the left of the house, I saw a great number of men, some of them white, some Arab, and some half-breeds, one mounted and the others on foot, and behind them a long caravan of slaves, with the slave sticks set upon their necks. As they came, these men fired guns at the people of the settlement, who ran this way and that. Some of the people fell, and more were made captive, but others of them got away, for they were at work in the fields and had seen the slave traders coming. Now, as I gazed the frightened, I saw my mistress, the shepherdess, flying toward the wall behind which I stood the book she was reading, being still in her hand. But as she reached it, the man mounted on the mule overtook her, and she turned about and faced him, settling her back against the wall. Then I crouched down and hid myself among some banana trees and watched what passed through a crack in the wall. The man on the mule was old and fat. His hair was white and his face yellow and wrinkled. I knew him at once for often I have heard of him before. Who has been the terror of this country for many years? He is named the Yellow Devil by the black people, but his Portuguese name is Perita, and he has his place in a secret spot down by one of the mouths of the Zambezi. Here he collects the slaves, and here the traders come twice a year with their dows to carry them to market. Now this man looked at my mistress, as she stood terrified with her back against the wall. Then he laughed and cried aloud in Portuguese, 
Here we have a pretty prize. This must be that Juana whose beauty I have heard. Where's your father, my dove? Gone trading up the river, has he not? Ah, I knew it. Or perhaps I should not have ventured here. But it was wrong of him to leave one so pretty all alone. Well, well. He is about his business, and I must be about mine. For I am a merchant also, my dove, a merchant who trades in blackbirds. One with silver feathers does not often come my way, and I must make the most of her. There is many a young man in our part who would bid briskly for such eyes as yours. Never fear, my dove, we will soon find you a husband. Thus the yellow devil spoke, white man, while the shepherdess, my mistress, crouched against the wall and stared at him with frightened eyes, and the slave traders, his servants, laughed aloud at his evil words. Presently she seemed to understand, and I saw her slowly lift her hand towards her head. Then I knew her purpose. Now there is a certain deadly poison, white man, of which I have the secret, and that secret I taught long ago to my mistress. It is so deadly that a piece of it no larger than the smallest ant can kill a man. Yes, the instant after it touches his tongue he will be dead. Living alone as she does in the wilds, it is the custom of my mistress to carry a portion of this poison hidden in her hair, since the time might come when she must use it to save herself from worse than death. Now it seemed to her that this hour was upon her, and I knew that she was about to take the poison. Then in my fear I whispered to her through the crack in the wall, speaking in an ancient tongue which I have taught her, the tongue of my own people, white man, and saying, Hold your hand, shepherdess. While you live you may escape, but from death there is no escape. It will be time to use the poison when the worst is with you. She heard and understood, for I saw her bow her head slightly, and her hand fell to her side. Then Perita spoke again. And now, if you are ready, he said, we will be moving, for it is eight days' journey to my little nest on the coast, and who can tell when the dows will come to fetch my blackbirds? Have you anything to say before you go, my dove? Now my mistress spoke for the first time, answering, I am in your power, but I do not fear you, for if need be I can escape you. But I tell you this, that your wickedness shall bring your own death upon you. And she glanced round at the bodies of those whom the slave traders had murdered, at the captives upon whom they were setting chains and forks of wood, and the columns of smoke that were rising from her home, for the roof of the settlement had been fired. For a moment the Portuguese looked frightened. Then he laughed aloud and said with an oath, crossing himself after the fashion of his people, as a protection against the curse. What, you prophecy, do you, my dove? And you can escape me at your will, can you? Well, we shall see. Bring the other mule, for this lady, you fellows. The mule was brought, and Juana, my mistress, was set upon it. Then the slave trader shot down such of the captives as they thought to be of no value. The drivers flogged the slaves with their three-thonged jumbucks of hippopotamus hide, and the caravan moved on down the banks of the river. When all had gone, I crept from my hiding place and sought out those men of the settlement who had escaped the slaughter, praying them to find arms and follow on the yellow devil's spore, waiting for an opportunity to rescue the shepherdess whom they loved. But they would not do this, for the heart was out of them. They were cowed by fear, and most of the headmen had been taken captive. No, they would do nothing except weep over their dead and the burnt corrals. You cowards, I said, if you will not come, then I must go alone. At least let some of you pass up the river and search for Mavoon to tell him what has chanced here in his house. The men said they would do this, and taking a blanket, and a little food, I followed up the track of the slave drivers. For four days I followed, 
sometimes coming in sight of them, till at length the meat was done and my strength left me. On the morning of the fifth day I could go no farther, so I crept to the top of a kopi and watched their long line winding across the plain. In the center were two mules, and on one of these mules sat a woman. Then I knew that no harm had befallen my mistress as yet, for she still lived. Now from the kopi I saw a little corral far away to the right, and to this corral I came that same afternoon with my last strength. I told its people that I had escaped from the slave drivers, and they treated me kindly. Here it was also, I learnt, that some white men from Natal were digging for gold in these mountains, and next day I travelled on in search of them, thinking perchance they would help me, for I know well that the English hate the slave drivers. And here, my lord, I come at last with much toil, and now I pray you deliver my mistress the shepherdess from the hands of the yellow devil. Oh, my lord, I seem poor and wretched, but I tell you that if you can deliver her, you shall win a great reward. Yes, I will reveal to you that which I have kept hidden all my life, I, even from Avun, my master. I will reveal to you the secret treasures of my people, the children of the mist. Now when Leonard, who all the while had been listening attentively, and in silence to Soa's tale, heard her last words, he raised his head and stared at her, thinking that her sorrows had made her mad. There was no look of madness upon the woman's fierce face, however, but only one of the most earnest and indeed passionate entreaty. So letting this matter go by for the while, he spoke to her. "'Are you then crazed, mother?' he said. "'You see that I am alone here with one servant, for my three companions of whom the people in the corral told you, are dead through fever, and I myself am smitten with it. And yet you ask me, alone as I am, to travel to the slave trader's camp that it is you know not where, and there single-handed to rescue your mistress, if indeed you have a mistress, and your tale is true. Are you then mad, mother? No, Lord, I am not mad. And that which I tell you is true, every word of it. I know that I ask a great thing, but I also know that you Englishmen can do great things when you are well paid. Strive to help me, and you shall have your reward. I, should you fail and live, I can still give you a reward, but not much, perhaps, but more than you have ever earned. Never mind the reward now, mother, broke in Leonard testily for the veiled sarcasm of Soa's speech had stung him. Unless, indeed, you can cure me of the fever, he added with a laugh. I can do that, she answered quietly. Tomorrow morning I will cure you. So much the better, he said, with an incredulous smile. And now, of your wisdom, tell me how I am to look for your mistress, to say nothing of rescuing her, when I do not know whither she has been taken. Probably this nest of which the Portuguese talk, is a secret place. How long has she been carried off? This will be the twelfth day, Lord. As for the nest, it is secret. That I have discovered. It is to your wisdom that I look to find it. Leonard mused a while. Then a thought struck him. Turning to the dwarf, who had been sitting by listening to all that was said in stoic silence, his great head resting upon his knees, he spoke to him in Dutch. Otter, were you not once taken as a slave? Yes, boss, once ten years ago. How was it? Thus, boss, I was hunting on the Zambezi with the soldiers of a tribe there. It was after my own people had driven me out because they said that I was too ugly to become their chief, as I was born to be. Then the yellow devil, the same man, of whom the woman speaks, fell upon us with Arabs and took us to his place, there, to await the slave dows. He was a stout man, horrible to see and elderly. The day the dows came in I escaped by swimming, and all the others who remained alive 
were taken off in ships to Zanzibar. Could you find your way to that place again, Otter? Yes, boss. It is a hard spot to find, for the path runs through morasses. Moreover, the place is secret and protected by water. All of us slaves were blindfolded during the last day's march. But I worked up my bandage with my nose, huh? My big nose served me well that day, and watched the path from beneath it. And Otter never forgets a road over which his feet have traveled. Also, I followed that path back. Could you find that spot from here? Yes, boss. I should go along these mountains, ten days' journey or more, till we struck the southernmost mouth of the Zambezi, below Luabo. Then I should follow the river down a day's journey. Afterwards, two more days through the swamps, and we come to the place. But it is a strong place, boss, and there are many men armed with guns in it. Moreover, there is a big cannon, a by-and-by. -and, -by. and again Leonard thought a moment. Then he turned to Soa and asked, Do you understand Dutch? No, well, I found out something of this nest from my servant. Bernita said that it was eight days' journey from your master's settlement. So your mistress has been there for some three or four days, if she ever reached it. Now from what I know of the habits of slave traders on this coast, the Dows will not begin to take in their cargoes for another month because of the monsoon. Therefore, if I am correct, there is plenty of time. Mind you, mother, I am not saying that I will have anything to do with this business. I must think it over first. Yes, you will, white man, she answered, when you know the reward. But of that I will tell you tomorrow, after I have cured you of your fever. And now I pray, black one, show me a place where I may sleep, for I am very weary. End of chapter 6「Of the People of the Mist」by H. Ryder Haggard. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Leonard swears on the blood of Akka. On the morrow Leonard woke early from a troubled sleep, for his fever would scarcely let him rest. But early as it was, the woman, Soa, had been up before him, and on coming out of the cave the first thing that he saw was her tall shape bending over a little fire, whereupon a gourd was boiling, the contents of which she stirred from time to time. "'Good morning to you, white man,' she said. "'Here is that which shall cure you of your sickness, as I promised to do.' And she lifted the gourd from the fire. Leonard took it and sniffed at the liquor, which smelt abominably. "'It's more likely to poison me, mother,' he said." No, no, she answered with a smile. Drink half of it now and half at midday, and the fever shall trouble you no more. So soon as the stuff was cool enough, Leonard obeyed, though with a doubting heart. Well, mother, he said, setting the gourd down with a gasp, if nastiness is any proof of virtue, your medicine should be good. It is good, she answered gravely. Many have been dragged from the edge of death by it. And here it may be stated, whether it was owing to Soa's medicine or to other causes, that Leonard began to mend from that hour. By nightfall he felt a different man, and before three days were over he was as strong as he had ever been in his life. But into the ingredients of that draft he never found the courage to inquire, and perhaps it was as well. Shortly after he had taken his dose, Leonard observed Otter, walking up the hill, bearing a huge lump of meat upon his shoulders. "'The old woman has brought us luck,' said the dwarf, as he loosed himself from his burden. "'Once more the bush is full of game. Scarcely had I reached it when I killed a young kudu. Fat, huh, fat, and there are many of them about.' Then they prepared breakfast and ate it, and when the meal was done, once more they talked. Mother, began Leonard, last night you asked me to undertake a great venture, and promised a reward in payment. Now, as you said, 
We Englishmen will do much for gold, and I am a poor man who seeks wealth. You demand of me that I should risk my life. Now tell me of its price. The woman Soa looked at him a while and answered, White man, have you ever heard of the people of the mist? No, he said, that is, except in London. I mean that I know nothing of such a people. What of them? This. I, Soa, am one of that people. I was the daughter of their head priest, and I fled from them many years ago because I was doomed to be offered up as a sacrifice to the god Yao, who is shaped like the black one yonder. And she pointed to Otter. This is rather interesting, said Leonard. Go on. White man, that people is a great people. They live in a region of mist, upon highlands beneath the shadow of the tops of snow mountains. They are larger than other men in size and very cruel, but their women are fair. Now at the beginning of my people I know nothing, for it's lost in the past. But they worship an ancient stone statue fashioned like a dwarf, and to him they offer the blood of men. Beneath the feet of the statue is a pool of water, and beyond the pool is a cave. In that cave, white man, he dwells, whom they adore in effigy above, he, Yal, whose name is Terror. Do you mean that a dwarf lives in the cave? asked Leonard. No, white man, not a dwarf, but a holy crocodile, which they name the Snake, the biggest crocodile in the whole world, and the oldest, for he has dwelt there from the beginning. It is this snake that devours the bodies of those who are offered to the Black One. As I remarked before, said Leonard, all this is very romantic and interesting, but I cannot see that there is much profit to be made out of it. White man, the lives of men are not the only thing which the priests of the Children of the Mist offer to their god. They offer also such toys as this, white man, and suddenly she unclosed her hand and exhibited to Leonard's astonished gaze a ruby, or what appeared to be a ruby, of such size and so lovely a color that his eyes were dazzled when he looked at it. The gem, though roughly polished, was uncut, but its dimensions were those of a small blackbird's egg. It was of the purest pigeon blood color without a flaw and worn almost round apparently by the action of water now as it chanced leonard knew something of gems although unhappily he was less acquainted with the peculiarities of the ruby than with those of most other stones thus although this magnificent specimen might be a true stone as indeed appeared to be the case it was quite possible that it was only a spinel or a garnet, and alas, he had no means of setting his doubts at rest. Do your people find many of these pebbles, Soa? he asked, and if so, where do they find them? Yes, white man, they find many, though few of such size as this. They dig them out of a dry river bed in some spot that is known to the priests only, and with them other beautiful stones of a blue color. Sapphires, probably, said Leonard to himself. They generally go together. Every year they dig them, she went on, and the biggest of those that are found in the digging they bind upon the brow of her who is to be offered as a wife to the god Yao. Afterwards, before she dies, they take the gem from her brow and store it in a secret place and there in that place are hidden all those who have been worn by victims of countless years. Moreover, the eyes of Yal are made of such stones, and there are others. This is the legend of my people, white man, that Yal, god of death and evil, slew his mother, Akka, in the far past. There where the stones are found, he slew her, and the red gems are her blood, and the blue gems are her tears, which she shed, praying to him for mercy. Therefore, the blood of Akka is offered to Yal, and so it shall be offered 
till Akka comes again to drive his worship from the land. A nice bit of mythology, I'm sure, said Leonard. Our old friends, the darkness and the dawn, in an African shape, I suppose. But listen to me, mother. This stone, if it is genuine, is worth many ounces of gold. But there are other stones so like it that none who are not learned can tell the difference. And if it be, one of these is of little value. Still it may happen that this and the others of which you speak are true rubies. At any rate, I should be willing to take my chance of that. But now tell me, what is your plan? This is a very pretty story, and the rubies may be there, but how am I to get them? I have a plan, white man, she answered. If you will help me, I offer to give you that stone, which I have borne hidden about me for many years, telling its story to no one, no, not even to Mavoon. I offer to give it to you, now, if you will promise to attempt the rescue of my mistress, for I know by your eyes that if once you promise, you will not desert the quest. And she paused, looking at him keenly. Very well, said Leonard, but considering the risk, the price does not seem quite good enough. As I told you, this stone may be worth nothing. You must make a better bid, mother. Truly, white man, I have judged you well, answered Soa with a sneer. Also, you are wise. Little work for little wage. Listen now. This is the pay I proffer you. If you succeed and the shepherdess is saved alive from the grip of the yellow devil, I promise this on her behalf and on my own, that I will guide you to the land of the people of the mist and show you a way to win for yourself all those other countless stones that are hidden there. Good, said Leonard, but why do you promise on behalf of your mistress and yourself? What has she got to do with it? Without her nothing can be done, white man. The people is great and strong, and we have no force with which to conquer them in war. Her craft must be your spear. You must speak more clearly, Soa. I cannot waste time in guessing riddles. How will you conquer this people by craft? And what has Miss Rude, whom you name the shepherdess, to do with the matter? That you shall learn by and by, after you have rescued her, white man. Till then, my lips are shut. I tell you that I have a plan, and this must be enough. For more I will not say. If you are not content, let me go seek help elsewhere. Leonard thought a moment, and seeing that she was determined not to be more explicit, said, Very well, then. And now, how am I to know that your mistress will fall in with this scheme? I answer for her, said Soa. She will never go back on my word. Look you, white man, it is not for a little thing that I would have told you this tale. If you journey to the land of the people of the mist, I must go with you, and there, should I be discovered, my death waits me. I tell you the tale, or some of it, and I offer you the bribe, because I see that you need money, and I am sure that without the chance of winning money, you will not hazard your life in this desperate search. But I love my mistress so well that I am ready to hazard mine. I, I would give six lives, if I had them, to save her from the shame of the slave. Now, white man, we have talked enough. Is it a bargain? What do you say, Otter? asked Leonard, thoughtfully, pulling at his beard. You have heard all this wonderful tale, and you are clever. Yes, boss, said the dwarf, speaking for the first time. I have heard the tale, and as for being clever, perhaps I am, and perhaps I am not. My people said that I was clever, and that is one of the reasons why they would not have me for a chief. If I had been clever only, they could have borne it, they said, or if I had been ugly only. But being both ugly and clever, I was no chief for them. They feared, lest I should rule them too well, and make all the people to be born ugly also. Ah, they were fools. They did not understand that it wants someone cleverer than I to make people so ugly. 
Never mind all that, said Leonard, who understood, however, that the dwarf was talking thus in order to give himself time to think before he answered. Show me your mind, Otter. Boss, what can I say? I know nothing of the value of that red stone. I do not know whether this woman, of whom my heart tells me no good, speaks truth or lies about a distant people who live in a fog and worship a god shaped as I am. None have ever worshipped me, yet there may be a land where I should be deemed worthy of worship, and if so, I should like to travel in that land. But as to the rescue of this shepherdess from the nest of the yellow devil, I do not know how it can be brought about. Say, mother, how many of the men of Mavoon were taken prisoner with your mistress? Fifty of them, perchance, answered Soa. Well, now, went on the dwarf, if we could loose those men, and if they are brave, we might do something. But there are many ifs about it, boss. Still, if you think the pay is good enough, we can try it. It will be better than sitting here, and it does not matter what happens. Every man to his fate, boss, and fate to every man. A good motto, said Leonard. Soa, I take your offer, though I am a fool for my pains. And now, with your leave, we will put the matter into writing, so that there may be no mistake about it afterwards. Get a little blood from the buck's flesh, Otter, and mix gunpow water with it. That will do for ink, if we add some hot water. While the dwarf was compounding this ominous mixture, Leonard sought of paper. He could find none. The last had been lost when the hut was blown away on the night of his brother's death. Then he bethought himself of the prayer book which Jane Beach had given him. He would not use the fly-leaf because her name was on it, so he must write across the title page. And thus he wrote in small, neat letters, with his mixture of blood and gunpowder, straight through the order of common prayer. Agreement between Leonard Ottram and Soa, the native woman. 1. The said Leonard Ottram agrees to use his best efforts to rescue Juana, the daughter of Mr. Rood, now reduced to a state of slavery and believed to be in the power of one Perita, a slave dealer. 2. In consideration of the service of the said Leonard Ultram, the said Soa delivers to him a certain stone, believed to be a ruby, of which the said Leonard Ultram hereby acknowledges the receipt. 3. Should the rescue be effected, the said Soa hereby agrees, on behalf of herself and the said Juana Rood, to conduct the said Leonard Ultram to a certain spot in central, southeast Africa inhabited by a tribe known as the People of the Mist, there to reveal to him and to help him to gain possession of the store of rubies used in the religious ceremonies of the said tribe. Further, the said Soa agrees on behalf of the said Juana Rude that she, the said Juana, will accompany her upon the journey and will play among the said People of the Mist any part that may be required of her as necessary to the success of this undertaking. 4. It is mutually agreed that these enterprises be prosecuted until the said Leonard Ottram is satisfied that they are fruitless. Signed, in the Mancia Mountains, East Africa, on the ninth day of May, 18. When he had finished this document, perhaps, one of the most remarkable that were ever written since Pizarro drew up his famous agreement for the division of the prospective spoils of Peru, Leonard read it aloud and laughed heartily to himself. It was the first time he had laughed for some months. Then he translated it to his companions, not without complacency, for it had a truly legal sound, and your layman loves to affect the lawyer. What do you think of that, Otter? he asked when he had finished. It is fine, boss, very fine, answered the dwarf. Wonderful are the ways of the white man. But, boss, how can the old woman promise things on behalf of another? Leonard pulled his beard reflectively. The dwarf 
had put his finger upon the weak spot in the document. But he was saved the necessity of answering by Soa herself, who said quietly, Have no fear, white man, that which I promise in her name my mistress will certainly perform. If so, be that you can save her. Give me that pen that I may make my mark upon the paper. But first do you swear upon the red stone that you will perform what you undertake in this writing. So Leonard laughed, swore, and signed, and Soa made her mark. Then Otter affixed his as witness to the deed, and the thing was finished. Laughing at the comicality of the transaction, which indeed he had carried out more by way of a joke than for any other reason, Leonard put the prayer book in his pocket and the great ruby into a division of his belt. The old woman watched the stone vanish with an expression of triumph on her face. Then she cried exultingly, Ah, white man, you have taken my pay, and now you are my servant to the end. He who swears upon the blood of Aka swears an oath indeed, and woe be to him if he should break it. Quite so, answered Leonard. I have taken your pay, and I mean to earn it, so we need not enter into the matter of the blood of Aka. It seems to me more probable that our own blood will be in question before all is said and done, and now we had better make ready to start. End of chapter 7「The People of the Mist by H. Ryder Haggard. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Start. Food was their first consideration, and to provide it, Leonard bade Otter cut the lump of raw meat into strips and set them upon the rocks to dry in the broiling sun. Then they sorted their goods and selected such of them as they could carry. Alas, but they were few. A blanket apiece a spare pair of boots apiece, some calomel and sundries from the medicine chest, a shotgun, and the two best rifles and ammunition, a compass, a water bottle, three knives, a comb, and a small iron cooking pot made up the total, a considerable weight for two men and a woman to drag across the mountains, untraveled plains and swamps. This baggage was divided into three loads, of which Soa's was the lightest, and that of Otter weighed as much as the other two put together. It was nothing, he said. He could carry the three if need were, and so great was the dwarf's strength that Leonard knew this to be no idle boast. At length all was prepared, and the articles that remained were buried in the cave together with the mining tools. It was not likely that they would ever return to seek them. More probably, they will lie there till, thousands of years hence, they are dug up and become priceless relics of the Anglo-African age. Still they hid them on the chance. Leonard had melted the fruits of their mining into little ingots. In all, there were about a hundred ounces of almost pure gold, the price of three men's lives. Half of these ingots he placed with the ruby in the belt about his middle, and half he gave to Otter, who hid them in his bundle. Leonard's first idea was to leave the bullion, because it entailed the carrying of extra weight. But he remembered, in time, that gold is always useful, and nowhere more so than among Portuguese and Arab slave drivers. By evening everything was ready, when the edge of the moon showed above the horizon. Leonard rose, and lifting his load, fastened it upon his shoulders with the loops of hide which had been prepared, Otter and Soa following his example. It was their plan to travel by night so long as the state of the moon served them, for thus they would escape the terrible heat and lessen the danger of being observed. Follow me in a few minutes, said Leonard to Otter. You will find me by the Donga. The dwarf nodded. A quarter of an hour later he started also with Soa and found his master, standing bareheaded by his brother's grave, 
taking a mute farewell of that which lay beneath before he left it forever to its long sleep in the untrodden wilderness. It was a melancholy parting, but there have been many such in the African fever belt. With one last look, Leonard turned and joined his companions. Then, having taken counsel with them and with a compass, he set his face to the mountain and his heart to the new adventures, hopes, and fears that were beyond it. The past was done with. It lay buried in yonder grave. But by the mercy of God he was still a man, living beneath the sunlight, and the future stretched away before him. What would it bring? He cared little. Experience had taught him the futility of anxieties as to the future. Perchance a grave like those which he had left. Perchance wealth, love, and honor. Whatever the event, he would strive to meet it with patience, dignity, and resignation. It was not his part to ask questions or to reason why. It was his part to struggle on and take such guerdon as it pleased Providence to send him. Thus thought Leonard, and this is the right spirit for an adventurer to cultivate. It is the right spirit in which to meet the good and ill of life, that greatest adventures which every one of us must dare. He who meets them thus and holds his heart pure and his hands clean will lay himself down to sleep without a sigh or a regret when mountain, swamp, river, and forest are all traveled, and the unknown innumerable treasure buried from the olden time, far out of reach of man's sight and knowledge, at last is open to his gaze. So Leonard started, and his hopes were high, notwithstanding the desperate nature of their undertaking. For here it must be confessed that the undesirable element of superstition still held fast upon his mind, and now with some slight cause. Had not his brother spoken of wealth that he should win by the aid of a woman, and had not a woman come to him, bearing in her hand a jewel which, if real, was in itself worth a moderate fortune, promising also, with the help of another woman, to lead him to a land where many such might be found. Yes, these things were so, and it may be pardoned to Leonard if, setting aside the theory of coincidence, he began to believe that the end would be as the beginning had been, that the great adventure would be achieved and the wealth be won. We need not follow the footsteps of Leonard Ultram and his companions day by day. For a week they traveled on, journeying, mostly by night, as they had proposed. They climbed mountains, they struggled through swamps and forests. They swam rivers. Indeed, one of these was in flood, and they never could have crossed it had it not been for Otter's powers of natation. Six times did the dwarf face the torrent, bearing their goods and guns held above the water with one hand. On the seventh journey he was still more heavily weighed, for, with some assistance from Leonard, he must carry the woman Soa, who could swim but little. But he did it, and without any great fatigue. It was not until Otter was seen stemming a heavy current that his vast strength could be measured. Here, indeed, his stunted stature was a positive advantage, for it offered the less surface for the water to act upon. So they traveled forward, sometimes hungry, sometimes full of meat, and even of what were better, of milk and corn. For the country was not entirely deserted. Occasionally they came to scattered corrals, and were able to obtain provisions from their peaceful inhabitants in return for some such trifle as an empty cartridge of brass. At first Leonard was afraid, lest Soa should tire, but notwithstanding her years and the hardships and sufferings which she had undergone, she showed wonderful endurance, endurance so wonderful that he came to the conclusion that it was her spirit which supported the frailty of her body and the ever-present desire to rescue one whom she loved as a surly dog sometimes loves its master. However this might be, she pushed forward with the rest, rarely speaking except to urge them onwards. 
On the eighth night of their journey they halted upon the crest of a high mountain. The moon had set, and it was impossible to go further. Moreover, they were weary with long marching. Wrapping themselves up in their blankets, for here the air was piercingly cold, they lay down beneath the shelter of some bushes to sleep till dawn. It was Otter who woke them. Look, boss, he said to Leonard, we have marched straight. There below us is the big river, and there far to the right is the sea. They looked. Some miles from them, across the great plain of bush that merged gradually into swamp, lay that branch of the Zambezi which they would reach. They could not see it, indeed, for its face was hidden by a dense cloak of soft white mist that covered it like a cloud. But there it was, one at last, and there away to the eastward shore the wide glitter of the sea, flecked with faint lines of broken billows, whence the sun rose in glory. See, boss, said Otter, when they had satisfied themselves with the beautiful sight, yonder some five hours' march from here, the mountains curved down to the edge of the river. Thither we must go, for it is on the farther side of those hills that the great swamp lies, where the yellow devil has his place. I know the spot well. I have passed it twice. They rested to noonday, but that night, before the moon rose, they stood on the curve of the mountain, close down to the water's edge. At length she came up and showed them a wonderful scene of desolation. Beyond the curve of the hills, the mountain trended out again to the south, gradually growing lower, till at last they melted into the skyline. In the vast semicircle thus formed ran the river, spotted with green islands, while between it and the high ground, over a space which varied from one mile at the narrowest to twenty miles in width at the broadest of the curve, was spread a huge and dismal swamp, marked by patches of stagnant water, clothed with reeds, which grew to the height of small trees, and exhaling a stench as of the rottenness of ages. The loneliness of the place was dreadful. Its waste and desolation were appalling, and yet it lived with a life of its own. Wild fowl flew in wedges from the sea to feed in its recesses. Alligators and hippopotami splashed in the waters. Bitterns boomed among the rushes, and from every pool and quagmire came the croaking of a thousand frogs. Yonder runs the slave road. Or yonder it once ran, said Otter, pointing to the foot of a hill. Let us go and see, answered Leonard. We can follow it for a while and camp. They climbed down the hill. At its foot, Otter cast backwards and forwards among the bushes like a hound. Then he held up his hand and whistled. I thought so, he said, as the others drew near. The path is still the same. Look, boss. As he spoke, he broke down the branches of creeping bush with his strong foot. Among them lay the moldering skeleton of a woman, and by her side that of a child. Not long dead, said Otter phlegmatically, perhaps two weeks. Ah, the yellow devil leaves a spore that all may follow. Soa bent over the bones and examined them. One of Mavoon's people, she said. I know the fashion of the anklets. They marched on for two hours or more, till at length they came to a spot where the trail ran to the edge of the water and stopped. What now, Otter, said Leonard. Here the slaves are put on boats, boss, the dwarf answered. The boats should be hidden yonder, and he pointed to some thick reeds. There, too, they weed the corn, killing out the weakly ones that they may not be burdened with them. Let us go and look. They went, Otter leading the way. Presently he halted. The boats are gone, he said, all except one canoe. But the weeds lie in a heap as of old. He was right. Piled in a little open space lay the bodies of some thirty men, women and children, recently dead. In other spaces close by were similar heaps, 
but these were of bleached bones on which the moonlight shone brightly, mementos of former sacrifices. Quite close to the first pile of dead was a mooring place, where at least a dozen flat-bottomed boats had been secured, for their impress could yet be seen in the sand. Now they were gone, with the exception of the canoe, which was kept there, evidently, to facilitate the loading and launching of the large boats. Nobody made any comment. The sight was beyond comment, but a fierce desire rose in Leonard's heart to come face to face with this yellow devil, who fattened on the blood and agony of helpless human beings, and to avenge them if he might. The light is going. We must camp here till morning, he said, after a while. And there they camped in this Golgotha, this place of bones, every one which cried to heaven for vengeance. The night wind swept over them, whispering in the giant reeds, fashioning the mists into fantastic shapes that threw strange shadows on the inky surface of the water as it crept slowly to the sea. From time to time the frogs broke into a sudden chorus of croaking, then grew silent again. The heron cried from afar as some alligator or river horse disturbed its rest, and from high in air came the sound of wings of wild fowl that traveled to the ocean. But to Leonard's fancy all these various voices of nature were as one voice that spoke from the piles of skeletons, gleaming faintly in the uncertain starlight, and cried, O oh God, how long shall iniquity have power on the earth? O oh God, how long shall thy hand be stayed? The darkness passed. The sun shone out merrily, and the travelers arose, brushed the night dew from their hair, and ate a scanty meal, for they must husband such food as they had with them. Then, as though by common consent, they went to the canoe, bailed her out, and started, Leonard and Otter using the paddles. Now it was that the dwarf's marvelous memory for locality came into play. Without him they could not have gone a mile, for their course ran through numberless lagoons and canals, cut by nature and the current in the dense banks of reeds. There was nothing to enable them to distinguish one of these canals from another. In truth, they all formed a portion of this mouth of the river. There were no landmarks to guide them. Everywhere spread a sea of swamp, diversified by rush-clothed islands, which to the inexperienced eye presented few points of difference. This was the road that Otter led them on unfalteringly. Ten years had passed since he had traveled it, but he never even hesitated. Time upon time they came to new openings in the reeds, leading this way and that. Then for a moment the dwarf would consider, and lifting his hand, point out which waterway they should choose, and they followed it. Thus they went on, for the most part of that day, till towards evening they reached a place where the particular canal they were following suddenly divided itself into two, one branch running north and one in a southerly direction. "'Which way, Otter?' asked Leonard. "'Nay, boss, I know not. The water has changed. There was no land here. The cut went straight on.' This was a serious matter, for one false step in such a labyrinth meant that they would be lost utterly. For long they debated which stream to take, and at last decided to try that on the left hand, which Otter thought ran more nearly in the true direction. They had already started in pursuance of his advice when Soa, who had remained silent hitherto, suggested that they should first go a little way down the right-hand stream on the chance of finding a clue. Leonard demurred, but as the woman seemed bent upon it, he yielded, and turning the boat, they paddled her some three hundred yards in this new direction. As there was nothing to be seen, however, Otter began to put her about again. "'Stay, white man,' said Soa, who had been searching the surface of the water with her quick eyes. "'What is that thing yonder?' And she pointed 
to a clump of reeds about forty yards away, among which some small white object was just discernible. Feathers, I think, Leonard answered, but we will go and see. In another moment they were there. It is paper, boss, said Otter in a low voice. Paper stuck on a reed. Lift it carefully, answered Leonard in the same tone, for his anxiety was keen. How came it that they found paper fixed to a reed in such a place as this? Otter obeyed, laying the sodden sheet on the thwart of the canoe before Leonard, who with Soa examined it closely. This is a leaf from that holy book in which my mistress reads, said the woman with conviction. I know the shape of it well. She has torn the paper out and affixed it on the reed as a sign to any who might come after her. It looks like it, said Leonard. That was a good thought of yours to turn up here, old lady. Then he bent down and read such verses as were still legible on the page. They ran thus. For he hath looked down from the height of his sanctuary. From heaven did the Lord behold the earth. To hear the groaning of the prisoner, to loose those that are appointed to death. The children of thy servants shall continue, and their seed shall be established before thee. Hmm, said Leonard to himself. The quotation seems very appropriate. If one had faith in omens now, a man might say that this was a good one, and in his heart he believed it to be so. Another hour's journey brought them to the point of the island along which they had been traveling. Ah, said Otter, now I know the path again. This is the right stream. That to the left must be a new one. Had we taken it, we should have lost our way and perhaps found it no more for days, or not at all. Say, Otter, said Leonard, you escaped from the slave camp. How did you do it? In a boat? No, boss. The boss knows that I am very strong. My spirit, who gave me ugliness, gave me strength also to make up for it, and it is well. For had I been beautiful as you are, boss, and not very strong, I should have been a slave now, or dead. With my chained hands I choked him, who was set to watch me, and took his knife. Then by my strength I broke the irons. See, boss, here are the scars of them to this day. When I broke them, they cut into my flesh, but they were old irons that had been used on many slaves, so I mastered them. Then as others came to kill me, I threw myself into the water and dived, and they never saw me more. Afterwards, I swam all the way, resting from time to time on the islands, and from time to time running along the shore where the reeds were not too thick, till at length I escaped into the open country. I traveled four days to reach it, and most of that time I was in the water. And what did you feed on? Roots and the eggs of birds. And did not the alligators try to eat you? Yes, one, boss, but I am quick in the water. I got upon the water snake's back. Ah, my spirit was with me then, and I drove the knife through his eye and into his brain. Then I smeared myself over with his blood, and after that they did not touch me, for they knew the smell and thought that I was their brother. Say, Otter, are you not afraid to go back to this place? Somewhat, boss, for there is that hell of which you white people talk, but where the boss goes, there I go also. Otter will not linger while you run. Also, boss, I am not brave, no, no, yet. I would look upon that yellow devil again, yes, if I myself must die to do it, and kill him with these hands. And the dwarf dropped the paddle, screaming, Kill him, kill him, kill him, so loudly that the birds rose in a fright from the marshes. Be quiet, said Leonard angrily. Do you want to bring the Arabs on us? But to himself he thought that he should be sorry for Perita, alias the yellow devil, if once Otter found a chance to fly at his throat. End of chapter 8
of the People of the Mist by H. Ryder Haggard. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Yellow Devil's Nest Sundown came, and, as on the previous night, the three travelers camped upon an island, waiting for the moon to rise. They had caught two flapper ducks in some weeds, and there was talk of lighting a fire to cook them by. Finally, Leonard negative the idea. It is dangerous, he said, for fires can be seen from afar. So they made a wretched meal of a little dried meat and some raw duck's eggs. It was fortunate that his caution prevailed, since, as the twilight was dying into dark, they heard the stroke of paddles and made out the shapes of canoes passing them. There were several canoes, each of which towed something behind it, and the men in them shouted to one another from time to time, now in Portuguese and now in Arabic. "'Lie still, lie still,' whispered Otter. "'These are the slave-men, taking back the big boats.' Leonard and Soa followed his advice to the letter, and the slavers, paddling furiously upstream, passed within thirty feet of where they crouched in the rushes. "'Give way, comrades,' called one of the men to the captain of the next canoe. The landing place is near, and there is rum for those who earn it. I hope that they will not stop here, said Leonard, beneath his breath. Hiss, answered Otter. I hear them landing. He was right. The party had disembarked about two hundred yards away. Presently they heard them collecting reeds for burning, and in ten minutes more two bright tongues of flames showed that they had lit their fires. "'We had better get out of this,' said Leonard. "'If they discover us—' "'They will not discover us, boss, if we lie still,' answered Otter. "'Let us wait a while. I have another plan. Listen, boss,' and he whispered in his ear. So they waited. From the fires below them came the sound of men eating and drinking, especially drinking. An hour passed, and Leonard rose, followed by Otter, who said, I will come too, boss. I can move like a cat. Where are you going, white man? asked Soa. I am going to spy upon those men. I understand Portuguese and wish to hear what they say. Otter, take your knife and revolver, but no gun. Good, said the woman, but be careful. They are very clever. Yes, yes, put in Otter, but the boss is clever also, and I, I am clever. Do not fear for us, mother. Then they started, creeping cautiously through the reeds. When they were within twenty yards of the fires, Leonard missed his footing and fell into a pool of water with a splash. Some of the slave dealers heard the noise and sprang to their feet. Instantly, Otter grunted, in exact imitation of a hippopotamus calf. "'A sea cow,' said a man in Portuguese. "'She won't hurt us. The fire will frighten her.' Leonard and Otter waited a while, then crept to a clump of reeds whence they could hear every word that was spoken. The men round the fire numbered twenty-two. One, their leader, appeared to be a pure-bred Portuguese. Some of the others were bastards and the rest Arabs. They were drinking rum and water out of tin pannikins, a great deal of rum and very little water. Many of them seemed half drunk already. At any rate, their tongues were loosened. "'May a curse fall upon our father, the devil,' said one, a half-breed. "'Why did he take it into his head to send us back with the boats just now? We shall miss the fun.' "'What fun?' answered the leader of the party. "'They won't cage the birds for another three or four days. "'The dows are not ready, "'and there is talk of an English cruiser, "'may she sink to hell, "'hanging about outside the river mouth.' "'No, not that,' said the man who had spoken first. "'There is not much sport "'in driving a lot of stinking niggers onto a dow. "'I mean the auction of the white girl, "'the English trader's daughter.' whom we caught up the river yonder. There's a beauty for some lucky dog. 
I never saw such a one. What eyes she has! And what spirit! Why, most of the little dears would have cried themselves blind by now. You needn't think about her, sneered his leader. She will go too dear for the likes of you. Besides, it is foolish to spend so much on one girl, white or black. When is the auction? It was to have been the night before the Dow sales, but now the devil says it shall be tomorrow night. I will tell you why. He is afraid of her. He thinks that she will bring misfortune to him and wants to be rid of her. Ah, he is a wag, is the old man. He loves a joke, he does. All men are brothers, he said yesterday, white or black. Therefore, all women are sisters. So he's going to sell her like a nigger girl. What is good enough for them is good enough for her. Ha uh ha. -huh. Pass the rum, brother. Pass the rum. Perhaps he will put it off, and we may be back in time after all, said the captain. Anyhow, here is a health to her, the love. By the way, did some of you think to ask the password before we left this morning? I forgot to do so myself. Yes, said a bastard. The old word, the devil. There is none better, comrades, none better, he coughed the leader. Then for an hour or more their talk went on. Partly about Juana, partly about other things. As they grew more drunk, the conversation became more and more revolting, till Leonard could scarcely listen to it and lie still. At length it died away, and one by one the men sank into a sound and sodden sleep. They did not set a sentry, for here on the island they had no fear of foes. Then Otter rose upon his hands and knees, and his face looked fierce in the faint light. Boss, he whispered, shall we? And he drew his hand across his throat. Leonard thought a while. His rage was deep, and yet he shrank from the slaughter of sleeping men, however wicked. Besides, could it be done without noise? Some of them would wake. Fear would sober them, and they were many. No, he whispered back, follow me, and we will cut loose the boats. Good, good, said Otter. Then, stealthily as snakes, they crept some thirty yards to where the boats were tied to a low tree. Three canoes and five large flat-bottomed punts, containing the arms and provisions of the slave dealers. Drawing their knives, they cut these loose. A gentle push sent them moving. Then the current caught them, and slowly they floated away into the night. This done, they crawled back again. Their path took them within five paces of where the half-breed ruffian lay, who had begun to talk, to which they had listened. Leonard looked at him and turned to creep away. Already Otter was five paces ahead, when suddenly the edge of the moon showed for the first time, and its light fell full upon the slaver's face. The sleeping man awoke, sat up, and saw them. Now Leonard dared not hesitate, or they were lost. Like a tiger, he sprang at the man's throat and had grasped it in his hand, before he could even cry aloud. Then came a struggle, short and sharp, and a knife flashed. Before Otter could get back to his side it was done, so swiftly and so silently that none of the band had wakened, though one or two of them stirred and muttered in their heavy sleep. Leonard sprang up unhurt, and together they ran, rather than walked, back to the spot where they had left Soa. She was watching for them, and pointing to Leonard's coat, asked, How many? One, answered Otter. I would it had been all, Soa muttered fiercely, but you are only two. Quick, said Leonard, into the canoe with you. They will be after us presently. In another minute they had pushed off and were clear of the island, which was not more than a quarter of a mile long. They paddled across the river, which at this spot ran rapidly and had a width of some eight hundred yards, so as to hide in the shadow of the opposite bank. When they reached it, Otter 
rested on his paddles, and gave vent to a suppressed chuckle, which was his nearest approach to laughter. "'Why do you laugh, Black One?' asked Soa. "'Look yonder,' he answered, and he pointed to some specks on the surface of the river, which were fast vanishing in the distance. "'Yonder go the boats of the slave-dealers, and in them are their arms and food. We cut them loose, the boss and I. There on the island sleep two and twenty men, all save one. There they sleep, and when they wake, what will they find? They will find themselves on a little isle, in the middle of great waters, into which, even if they could, they will not dare to swim, because of the alligators. They can get no food on the island, for they have no guns, and ducks do not stop to be caught. But outside the alligators will wait in hundreds to catch them. By and by they will grow hungry. They will shout and yell, but none will hear them. Then they will become mad, and falling on each other, they will eat each other and die miserably, one by one. Some will take to the water. Those will drown or be caught by the alligators. And so it shall go on till they are all dead, every one of them, dead, dead, dead. And again Otter chuckled. Leonard did not reprove him. With the talk of these wretches yet echoing in his ears, he could feel little pity for the horrible fate which would certainly overtake them. Hark! A faint sound stole across the quiet waters, a sound which grew into a clamor of fear and rage. The slavers had awakened. They had found the dead man in their midst, mysteriously slain by an invisible foe. And now the clamor gathered to a yell, for they had learned that their boats were gone and that they were trapped. From their shelter on the other side of the river, as they dropped leisurely down the stream, Leonard and Otter could catch distant glimpses of the frantic men rushing to and fro in the bright moonlight and seeking for their boats. But the boats had departed to return no more. By degrees the clamor lessened behind them till at last it died away, swallowed in the silence of the night. Then Leonard told Soa what he had heard by the slaver's fire. "'How far is the road, Black One?' she asked, when he had finished. "'By sundown tomorrow we shall be at the Yellow Devil's gates,' answered Otter. Two hours later they overtook the boats which they had cut adrift. Most of them were tied together, and they floated peacefully in a group. "'We had better scuttle them,' said Leonard. "'No, boss,' answered Otter. "'If we escape, we may want them again.' Yonder is the place where we must land, and he pointed to a distant tongue of marsh. Let us go with the boats there and make them fast. Perhaps we may find food in them, and we need food. The advice was good, and they followed it, keeping alongside of the punts and directing them when necessary with a push of the paddles. They reached the point just as dawn was breaking. Here, in a sheltered bay, they found a mooring place to which they fastened all the boats with ropes that hung ready. Then they searched the lockers, and to their joy discovered food in plenty, including cooked meat, spirits, biscuits, bread, and some oranges and bananas. Only those who have been forced to do without farinaceous food for days or weeks will know what this abundance meant to them. Leonard thought he had never eaten a more delicious meal or drunk anything so good as the rum and water with which they washed it down. They found other things also, rifles, cutlasses, and ammunition, and better than all a chest of clothes which had evidently belonged to the officer or officers of the party. One suit was a kind of uniform, plentifully adorned with gold lace, having tall boots and a broad felt hat with a white ostrich feather in it to match. Also, there were some long Arab gowns and turbans, the gala clothes of the slave-dealers, 
which they took with them in order to appear smart on their return. But the most valuable find of all was a leather bag in the breeches of the uniform, containing the sum of the honest gains of the leader of the party, which he had preferred to keep in his own company even on his travels. On examination, this bag was found to hold something over a hundred English sovereigns and a dozen or fifteen pieces of Portuguese gold. Now, boss, said Otter, this is my word, that we put on these clothes. What for? asked Leonard. For this reason, that should we be seen by the slave traders, they will think us of their brethren. The advantages of this step were so obvious that they immediately adopted it. Thus disguised, with a silk sash round his middle and a pistol stuck in it, Leonard might well have been mistaken for the most ferocious of slave traders. Otter, too, looked sufficiently strange, robed as an Arab and wearing a turban. Being a dwarf, the difficulty was that all the dresses proved too long for him. Finally, it was found necessary to cut one down by the primitive process of laying it on a block of wood and chopping through it with a saber. When this change of garments had been effected, and their own clothes with the spare arms were hidden away in the rushes on the somewhat remote chance that they might be useful hereafter, they prepared for a start on foot across the marshes. By an afterthought, Leonard fetched the bag of gold and put it in his pocket. He felt few scruples in availing himself of the money of the slave driver, not for his own use indeed, but because it might help their enterprise. Now their road ran along marshes, and by secret paths that none save those who have traveled them could have found. But Otter had not forgotten. On they went through the broiling heat of the day. Since linger they dared not. They met no living man on their path, though here and there they found the body of some wretched slave, whose corpse had been cast into the reeds by the roadside. But the road had been trodden, and recently, by many feet, among which were the tracks of two mules or donkeys. At last, about an hour before sunset, they came to the home of the Yellow Devil. The nest was placed thus. It stood upon an island having an area of ten or twelve acres. Of this, however, only about four and a half acres were available for living space. The rest was a morass hidden by a growth of very tall reeds, which morass, starting from a great lagoon on the northern and eastern sides, ran up to the low enclosure of the buildings that, on these faces, were considered to be sufficiently defended by the swamp and the wide waters beyond. On the southern and western aspects of the camp, matters were different. For here the place was strongly fortified, both by art and nature. Firstly, a canal ran round those two faces, not very wide or deep indeed, but impassable except in boats, owing to the soft mud at its bottom. On the further side of this canal an earthwork had been constructed, having its crest stoutly palisaded and its steep sides planted with a natural defense of aloes and prickly pears. So much for the exterior of the place. Its interior was divided into three principal enclosures. Of these three, the easternmost was the site of the nest itself, a long, low, thatched building of wood, in front and to the west of which there was an open space or courtyard with a hard floor. Herein were but two buildings, a shed supported on posts and open from the eaves to the ground, where sales of slaves were carried on, and further to the north, almost continuous with the line of the nest itself, but separate from it, a small erection, very strongly built of brick and stone, and having a roof made from the tin linings of ammunition and other cases. This was a magazine. All round this enclosure 
stood rows of straw huts of native build, evidently occupied as a camp by the Arabs and half-breed slave traders of the baser sort. The second enclosure, which was to the west of the nest, comprised the slave camp. It may have covered an acre of ground, and the only buildings in it were four low sheds, similar in every respect to that where the slaves were sold, only much longer. Here the captives lay picketed in rows to iron bars, which ran the length of the sheds, and were fixed into the ground at either end. This camp was separated from the nest enclosure by a deep canal, thirty feet in width and spanned at one point by a slender and primitive drawbridge that led across the canal to the gate of the camp. Also, it was protected on the nest side by a low wall, and on the slave camp side by an earthwork planted as usual with prickly pears. On this earthwork near the gate and little guardhouse, a six-pounder cannon was mounted, the muzzle of which frowned down upon the slave camp, a visible warning to its occupants of the fate that awaited the forward. In all, the defenses of this part of the island were devised as safeguards against the possible emutois of the slaves, and also to provide a second line of fortifications should the nest itself chance to be taken by an enemy. Beyond the slave camp lay the garden that could only be approached through it. This also was fortified by water and earthworks, but not so strong. Such is a brief description of what in those days was the strongest slavehold in Africa. End of chapter 9